Howard. Yeah, Sean, what's happening? Man, one of the great things about our podcast. Yeah, we got, there's a lot of great things about our podcast. There are many of them. Many, many. One of them is our several different sponsors that we have. Speaking of that, check this out. Look at here. See this? Rocking a shirt from Emory Lane. Yeah, I did. Uh, for those listening and watching, Emory Lane has a large variety of products for women and children, and men evidently, as Howard's wearing one, and they're quickly increasing their offerings for other men as well. The thing I personally love about Emory Lane, Howard, is that they are family-owned and operated by a law enforcement wife. All of their products are designed in Nashville, Tennessee. They actually make pretty good whiskey there. They do. Not as good as Kentucky, but... No, sir. Emory Lane is one of the largest selections of exclusively designed first responder apparel on the market today. You got to go check them out on Instagram or Facebook at Emory Lane Co. And use promo code STICKS for 20% off your next order. That's promo code STICKS, as in my nickname, S-T-I-C-K-S, for 20% off your next order at emorylaneco.com and that is e m o r y l a n e c o.com the first rule of staying safe be aware of your surroundings crime in place is the iphone app that keeps you aware of crime rates anywhere you are anywhere you want to go or just need to know about nationwide crime in place uses current fbi data for property and personal crimes so it's always up to date what's more it's free to download. Just go to the Crime in Place app on your Android or iPhone. That's the Crime in Place app. Stay aware, stay safe with Crime in Place. Hey, Sean. Yeah, Howard. We had a big weekend. We went to New York, didn't we? We did. We had a great time. Got to meet our producer out there, Sam Goldberg, who is uh, monitoring, listening to this. The yeah. guy behind the scenes that he doesn't get his face on camera, but a huge part of this. Absolutely. But, you know, we... Uh it was hot up there. It was hot. But you know where um, it's actually warmer? Uh, lately, it's been like, like Idaho. Right. But actually, we're, we're going to talk about the Puerto Rico. Oh, yes. Our, our guest today uh, used to be a prosecuting attorney. Okay. So that's a different aspect of the law. We've, we've had police officers. We've had gangsters. We've had informants. We've had people who do search and rescue. But this is the first attorney that we have this is. had on here. And the important thing about... Um, the law is you need a lawyer in order to make sure that all these criminals get prosecuted, right? Well, I run into a lot of bad guys that think they are lawyers, but, yeah, go, they think they know it more than, than the police officers at times. But, yeah, well, I we agree. Ha we actually have a lawyer on today. Okay. And she has been a, a prosecuting attorney for Puerto Rico. And I'm trying to say that without my redneckness in there. How did I do? Her name is Pretty Marie. well. Her Pretty name well. is Maria Dominguez, and she's going to talk to us today about some of the stuff that she's seen in Puerto Rico, which you can imagine is pretty cool. So, Maria, I can see uh, behind you there, you've definitely got a few more degrees, certificates, <laughs> uh, accolades, and Howard and I combined. We've got Kane's Ballroom here, yeah, which is a this. historic music venue in Tulsa, which, by the way, Green, Day's playing Green Day did a surprise pop-up show and is playing there tonight. That's pretty rad that yeah. they're, uh, they're getting ready to start their tour off and just day before make an announcement. So pretty cool. Hey, but you know what? Uh, there's a, we, have, we have cocktails and then we have cocktails? That is correct. So tonight, uh, Ms. Dominguez, can you tell us what our cocktail is going to be? Well, I'm having a rum and coke. Well, that's perfect because guess what we're having? We're going to have a rum and coke. Hey, and you had, a, good. you had a very charming way of saying Bacardi. Would you say that for us? Bacardi. Yes. Bacardi. If I said that, somebody would think I was putting on airs. So I'm not going <laughs> to. And that's not to be confused with Chad Ayers. And Chad Ayers actually has a Bacardi. He actually has whiskey and coke. So He likes the color red also for he, boots. but he, he does. So we're going to do that. So while we're pouring our drinks and everything... We would like you to kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and I, I where you. where you're actually located right now. Um, right now, I'm talking to you from Guaynabo, Puerto Rico. Um, I do have an office in Puerto Rico, an office uh, also in Miami, Florida. Um, I was a career federal prosecutor, uh, first at the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in Miami, Southern District of Florida. And then uh, more recently in the District of Puerto Rico, that's federal court, 
Um, and I retired in 2015, and now I do criminal defense work in addition to uh, other type of legal work like civil litigation. Um, I was also right out of law school. Uh, I was a state prosecutor when Janet Reno was the state attorney in Miami, and I worked for her for a couple of years. Um, so uh, here I am, uh, I think 35 years later, uh, now uh, operating, operating on the opposite end um, in criminal defense work and enjoying it immensely. Are you enjoying better paychecks as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. shocker. Huh? Years of sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that that is something you know. Obviously, the the federal prosecutors do get paid better than uh, you know those at the state level, but it is a common thing we see. Um, you get obviously a lot of courtroom experience. You know, prosecuting definitely. criminal cases um, more so even on the state level than you do federal level, just because the number of cases you do. But it is very common, Howard, that uh, kids. When I say kids, I'm old enough to say kids now, but people right out of law school, um, you know, they get hired by the district attorney's office and they're not making much money. I mean, literally at all. They're making less than than, our, than the cops are at times. Yeah. Um, I started they, making $20,000 a year when I was out of law school and yeah. uh, joined the state attorney's office. And I'll tell you, I had a trial my first day on the job, a bench trial. Really? I <laughs> thought I was going to cry. I thought I was going to puke. It was, uh, you know, but you get that trial exposure so that you're very comfortable in a courtroom and can think on your feet. So it has a lot of value. In yeah. Terms lot, of it, it, yeah. And, and that's exactly a lot of these, you know, they'll work two, three, four, five years, uh, a lot of courtroom experience. And, and here in Tulsa, we have a lot of oil and gas companies. Um, and you know, these guys get hired, then they they go over there and start making big money and, uh, they've got the experience. Right. Hey, so what, what made you go into the law? What was your calling? You know, um, in my house, it was either law or medical school. So I think it was more of a default. Uh, but I was very fortunate that I really found my niche because it's become clear to me throughout my career um, that this is really what I was born to do. And so I guess I was lucky uh, that uh, I made the right choice. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize so much what I was in for when I made the decision to go to law school. Uh, it became a little bit clearer to me when I was about halfway through, but by the time I graduated, I was fully committed to, to doing this as a career. Well, being a prosecutor and attorney, he was talking about people going in there for four or five years. You were there a long time. so Right. Well, I was at the state for two years, and then I, was, um, I had a brief stint in private practice. But really, I was a career prosecutor in the federal government as an assistant U.S. attorney, both in the Miami office and then in the San Juan office, uh, the District of Puerto Rico, um, and really had the opportunity to investigate and try more sophisticated cases across the board, board both narcotics, violent crime, and also white collar crime, um, and uh, really gave me a wealth of experience, which has served me well now uh, in my, my own practice now on the, on the defense side. How did you end up uh, there in Puerto Rico from Miami? And, and you know, kind of as you mentioned, the white collar crimes, the drug crimes, obviously, you know, Miami, uh, right. well known for, you know, large scale drugs coming into the country and things like that. So I imagine you had some some pretty big cases federally. We did. And, and the office still continues to handle a lot of uh, significant drug cases. I actually made a, a change in my personal life. Um, I got divorced and I decided to sort of uh, regroup and, and start anew. And um, I came for a detail, a three month detail on the island. And I fell in love with the island and its people and just decided to make the switch. And it was pretty significant switch culturally. But um, this is a very charming island, understanding that there's a lot of violence uh, and a lot of crime. Uh, but there's also uh, a lot of charm and, and people here are very hospitable and, and very kind and, um, you know, neighbors actually socialize and know each other and, and you know, strangers will come into a restaurant and say hello and buen provecho, as they say. Um, so it's, it's it, you know, the, the culture here sort of captivated me and um, I really fell in love with the island and I've been here, you know, for over 25 years. Well, being a prosecuting attorney, did you ever get angry at some of your, like, just get, like, pissed at some of the people you were prosecuting? Like, oh, I'm going to nail this son of a bitch. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think that when you have perspective, you've been doing this a long time, you realize that not everybody that gets prosecuted or violates the law is a bad person. Right. There's many good people that make unfortunate decisions uh, that cost them dearly in their lives and then um, try to regroup from that and to turn their life around. And then there are those people that you think must have been born evil uh, and uh, don't have a real conscience uh, and don't ever regret any of the harm that they've inflicted on others. Um, and, and, you know, you see, you see everything. You see a little bit of everything. Fortunately, I think that um, seeing uh, defendants that are more purely evil is the exception, although I've seen that happen in my life and in my career. Um, I think you realize that human beings are complex and that they can have moments of weakness. Um, and I see that now even more so on the defense side where I have an actual living, breathing client that I commiserate with, that I can you know, I suffer with, I, I understand their pain. Um, and I can understand that, you know, uh, human beings are imperfect, uh, and that everybody has a right to a second chance, right? Um, so that that's become clearer, I think, now on this side of, of the arena. So what do you like working better? I mean, being a prosecutor, being a defense attorney? I, I think that, um, you know, the 25 years I spent as a federal prosecutor were amazing. Um, I think it's, it's a very rewarding job. I'm very glad that I did what I did. I'm very glad I made that commitment. Um, and now on this side of, of the fence, um, I'm glad that I made the switch when I did, when I still have a few years left, you know, of, of practice in me. Uh, because I have, I think I have a more global perspective, a richer perspective, having been on both sides. Um, I think that that has served me well to be able to um, zealously represent my clients uh, at this stage of my career. Well, when you said you have a few more years left for our uh, listeners out there who aren't watching this, um, uh, Ms. Dominguez, or should I call you Esquire Dominguez? Is that no, how? No, you can call me Maria. Bar Barrister, Maria. Barrister, Barrister Maria. Maria, Maria. Maria. Uh, um, she looks. She looks like she's about thirty-two. So there's. Oh my yeah, god! No, yeah. literally. Yeah, we, we were like. Honestly, man. when you said that many years, I was very, very surprised. Yeah, so was like, kudos <laughs> to you. The, the the Puerto Rican sun and rum down there is doing yeah, well for absolutely. you. So. And speaking of rum, this rum and coke was an excellent choice. Yeah, this it's is the much... first for us on the show. We haven't yeah. had rum and coke. So, you yeah. know. Wonderful. We, we hate apple crown. Have you had that before? No, I haven't. I'm not a big drinker. So, <laughs> save yourself. Yeah, it's horrible. Don't do it. So I'm sure that you saw some interesting stuff being in Miami. We want to hear, as you say, can we hear a couple war stories? Of course. Well, I've had some interesting cases in my career. And I think um, more so when I came to the District of Puerto Rico, only because I was a more experienced prosecutor and got assigned probably more, you know, significant cases. Um, let me think. Uh, well, in Miami, when I was a state prosecutor, in one of my first jury trials that I had, something interesting happened that has never happened to me since, uh, was that I was prosecuting someone who was uh, accused of um, about seven home invasion robberies. Pretty serious crime. You know, and, and, your home and, is your castle. Right. Maria, not let me, the same. Huh? Let, don't mean to cut you off. I apologize for that. On these home invasions, at least here in the States, you know, for the most part, people that have home invasions done on them are typically, there's a reason why they are chosen. Right. They're, but this guy was just. Just random um, homes. A, a random homes. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, know, I, just, I know what you're saying, but these were random homes. It was repetitive in the same neighborhood. Okay. Hitting different homes. Um, and he had a pretty long rap sheet. And so, uh, this is one of my first jury trials. Um, and, um, he was convicted, uh, but after the sentence was announced, he made a jump for me, uh, and actually got on top of the table and had to be pulled down by, wow. uh, yeah. So that was a uh, sort of a uh, baptism by fire. It was, uh, it was, uh, a, 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 a pretty 
a, a pretty difficult moment. Uh, you know, you think, well, what if the staff had not been quick? What if the court and security had not reacted quickly? Because he was a pretty big guy. Um, and I, I was a lot smaller back then. <laughs> well, hey, not to throw any shade on bailiffs or st anything, but I've watched some of those courtroom things. Some of those bailiffs don't look like they're the they're the fastest. Yeah. Well, some of them, you know, I mean, it's with everything. They get older uh, and, and a little bit wider. But thankfully, uh, the ones in my courtroom were very – very on the on the ball and they were able to grab him before we made any contact. So that was one of my earlier experiences. Um, and I've had a lot of interesting cases in my career. Um, there was a case that I retired before I came to trial, but I was the prosecutor that investigated and uh, indicted the case. And I had some help obviously from other um, prosecutors along the way, but it was a case that has already been uh, completed. I'm not sure what the status of the appeal, but the, the case, uh, the trial has already concluded and she was convicted and already sentenced to life. And it's uh, what's called the Black Widow case. Um, it actually received a fair amount of, uh, of exposure. Um, and uh, essentially it was a Puerto Rican woman uh, who met and married a Canadian um, citizen. What was her name? Aurea Vasquez Rijos. Okay. Um, and the victim's name was Adam Angham, uh, a very um, talented entrepreneur who was investing in hotels and other investments in Puerto Rico. Uh, and they met and she immediately latched onto him because he was wealthy. You mean that um, happens? That, that happens. What? Really? Uh, but, you know, the sad part is that this guy was really a very good person, um, very decent guy from a very decent family, good family, um, and um, married her because uh, she made him believe that she was pregnant. And she lied um, to him, huh? She lied to him. Um, and um, eventually, you know, this was doomed to fail, this this union, this marriage, because there wasn't really love uh, on her part. Um, and so uh, he asked her for a divorce. And uh, of course, they had a prenup. And if they got divorced under the prenup, she would get next to nothing or next to nothing compared to what she wanted and what she would stand to inherit as a widow, right? And so she actually hired someone uh, to kill him. Okay, so let's let, let's talk about that. Not that I have any that I'm trying to learn anything here or propagate knowledge. Yeah. How do you how do you go about hiring somebody to kill somebody? Well, uh, I guess you have to move in certain circles, right? Because uh, I don't know anybody uh, from my personal circles that would do that. Well, um, when, we, when, it, when we wrap this podcast up, I'll pass the number to you. <laughs> so <laughs> we do some people. We can get to Puerto Rico pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we no, uh, well, and, and uh, I'm going to, I'll oh, jump I mean, in. On, so she I'll met people. She met people. Uh, and specifically, she met someone in Old San Juan uh, that was affiliated with a restaurant called The Pink Skirt, owned by, uh, by, her, by her family. The Pink and, Skirt. Um, pink Skirt was like a bar. And, um, you know, she, she hired this guy to kill him and arranged to meet with him, with Adam, at a restaurant, a very well-known restaurant, pricey restaurant. And um, what, as they walked out, I mean, she literally sat there and had dinner with this guy, with her husband, knowing that when he left the restaurant, he'd be killed, right? Very cold and calculating. And when they left the restaurant, uh, he was approached by the person that had been hired, Alex, and was beaten to death um, with a brick. Like oh, a, God. A wow, that's personal. On the head. And what is really, truly dramatic and sad is that when he was being beaten to death and she stood by, right, she, he actually yelled to her, run, baby, run. He was oh. worried her safety in his final moments, right? Uh, and he was killed. 
And what makes this story more dramatic are a few twists and turns that it had. First of all, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the local prosecuting authority in Puerto Rico, they indicted the wrong person for that crime. The feds came in and investigated because murder for hire, even instrumentality of, of interstate commerce is used, such as a phone. Um, it's the feds have jurisdiction, right? And so we came in and we investigated and we found the real culprit. He ended up confessing. Uh, the locals had to dismiss against the person that was wrongfully prosecuted and wrongfully convicted and was serving time in a, a local jail for a crime he didn't commit. How, how long, what was the time frame from the time this guy was charged, convicted until the right person was identified, I guess? I think it was probably within the year. Wow. But I mean, doing a year in jail is a long time when you sure. haven't really done anything and really dealing with the uncertainty of what's going to happen to you, because I'm sure he didn't anticipate that the right, the, the wrong would be righted. So, um, and also to make things dramatic, um, the defendant, the, the decedent's family, uh, Adam's family, um, instituted litigation to prevent Audia from getting uh, Adam's inheritance. Uh, and she absconded to Italy. Really? And ended up, thankfully, not inheriting anything from Adam because she wasn't here to face the litigation. She absconded, left to Italy, and was able to prevent extradition because um, she hooked up with an Italian man and had twins in Italy. So she went lying about the twins. She had the no, twins. No, she wasn't. She actually did have twins. And then uh, I think this is now public knowledge, so I can comment on this, but she was actually lured to Spain uh, to be a tour guide for a group of tourists and was arrested in Spain. Okay. And, so then, and then had to be extradited from Spain, which took, I think, a couple more years and then got pregnant again in Spain. While uh, in custody? While in prison. Uh, and had another daughter who is now, I think, residing with her parents in Puerto Rico. So she was doing everything, using every trick in the book at her disposal to prevent extradition. Um, but ultimately, she was brought to justice and tried in federal court in the District of Puerto Rico and convicted. And during the trial, um, there was testimony from a local lawyer who testified that she tried, she approached him trying to get him to find a hitman to kill her husband before she actually contracted the hitman who actually murdered Adam, Alex. How about we all get together and script out a Netflix show, <laughs> a little series yeah. here or something. I mean, this is this is pretty good. The, the, the oh. getting pregnant and prison in spain hey spanish spain. hey what i want to know about is they lured her there to be a travel guide so was this a sting who it was who, a ruse was this interpol it was, was a it, ruse that was organized by the government by the about, oh did they get jason Bourne to do it <laughs> no. it wasn't jason Bourne. do you remember no. the old do you remember the old uh gosh this was like early 90s and stuff when they had people with a bunch of outstanding warrants and Back when big ass TVs first came out, and they yeah, were like, yeah. "Hey, you know, you've won, you've won a big TV show about here on this date," and all these people would show up and get arrested. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, same type of thing. So yeah, there was actually a big um, public corruption operation here in in San Juan. There's been actually a couple of those. Uh, one of them was called Blue Shame, and it was essentially a um, a uh, an investigation that was targeting corrupt local police officers, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a big group. Uh, and the way that they orchestrated those arrests, if you can believe it or not, is that they made them believe that they were in a training, in a police <laughs> training. And actually as part of the training, they had to pl be placed under arrest to demonstrate proper arrest procedure. And they were actually being arrested. 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> hey, what kind of corruption stuff were they doing? Well, um, we've had a lot of public corruption cases, and it's not easy to be an honest cop in Puerto Rico. There's a lot of good ones. Uh, but we've had, for example, the FBI had their lar- their, their biggest um, uh, sting operation in, in the entire country, in the District of Puerto Rico, in, in an operation called Guard Shack, where uh, police officers were actually being paid by a presumptive, presumptive narc, uh, narco, who was actually an undercover uh, agent, um, who was um, selling large amounts of narcotics out of an apartment in Isla Verde in the beach area. Uh, that had been uh, rented by the authorities and properly equipped with video and audio equipment. And uh, they were being paid two, $3,000 for an hour's worth of work to protect uh, the drugs during the narcotics transference or narcotics sale. And in fact, they were being set up by an undercover police officer who had been persuaded to cooperate because he was already you know caught another corrupt corrupt uh behavior and conduct on his part and so it was as my recollection is over a hundred uh defendants in that case uh that were dead to rights because they were on tape uh on videotape and audio tape recorded protecting the 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 drugs they were sham drugs but were made to look like drugs uh during this uh sale uh, and then being paid on camera also for their hours work of time. Some of them showed up wearing their police officer uniforms. All of them were armed. Um, as as uh, the operation grew, uh, police officers who were the original targets of this investigation started bringing colleagues, barbers, uh, national guardsmen, uh, correctional officers, to also provide protection or armed protection for these drugs during these presumptive sales. And uh, everyone ended up being indicted. Uh, most of them pled guilty, some went to trial, and I believe all were convicted. How long ago was this? I want to say it's before I retired, maybe 10 years ago. Man. It, uh, it, what you know what a cop there in Puerto Rico makes? Not that I'm justifying anybody not doing much something, at all. but I know it's not much. Yeah, and you not you much. hit you hit it right on the head earlier talking about the violence down there and and you know being a charming country or you know things like that. But there is a website called Officer Down Memorial Page, and what they do is anytime an officer is killed in the line of duty anywhere in the country, including Puerto Rico, uh, they they list it, and for being such a small. Uh, number of officers down there. There are several a year killed in violence down there, and uh, you know that are shot and killed. And and I know they it's don't. Very much down there. It very, is. Very it's very tough. It's, it's for, a tough for job down officers. there. Yeah. Well, let very me tough you. for police officers on this island. What? Hey, why do you think Puerto Rico is not a state yet? Is it the stars uh, thing? In you know, I think it's not going to be a state until the U.S. wants it to be a state. Until you know. There is political will to make it a state. I think that most people in Puerto Rico would vote in favor of statehood. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I think that um, there has to be political will in the, the U.S. to make it happen. I got gotcha. you. Okay, so let's go back to this Black Widow. So she she hires a guy. She runs in certain circles. She finds a guy. She gets him to go ahead and kill them. They charge a an, another gentleman for right. the crime um, based on... I guess somebody said, yeah, he was based on eyewitness testimony. And, and, and I, I think, you know, the investigation was not very thorough and, you know, there were a lot of holes that were punched into that evidence after we, the feds investigated. Uh, And we had a confession from the real killer. And so really the locals had no choice, but to, you know, to make that right, because, you know, uh, this guy confessed and he had details about the crime and, uh, you know, details about his um, dealings with Audia and dealings, uh, details about how they negotiated uh, what would happen, where they would be, uh, how this would go down. The fact that he also struck her in order to give her plausible deniability. So it became very clear that, you know, 
um, that they had the wrong guy. I don't think there was ever an intent to 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 implicate somebody that was innocent, but it it happened and it it had to be corrected. What what, what was this uh, guy getting paid? What was his payoff for committing this murder with a brick? Um, you know, I think that um, he he did, never got anything. I think she promised to pay him a lot of money from the inheritance she was supposed to get. But I don't think she ended up paying him anything. And in fact, one of, of the, the compelling um, elements of proof in that trial was that after she uh, refused to pay or didn't pay, he started writing her letters, trying to collect on that money. <laughs> and those letters, uh, the evidence established, were actually sent to Audia through her sister, uh, who was also charged and convicted. And uh, the evidence was suggested that she had opened and read the letters, which is how, you know, how it was obvious that she also was aware of what had happened and what had gone down. Yeah. Do, do you, you know, refer to a collection agency or, you know, you, you don't, if you don't pay this, it's going to go on your credit report. I mean, the guy yeah, I mean, somebody. usually those kind of debts are not settled in quarter with a collection. No, they're agency. not. Well, you know, and, and earlier you had, we were discussing how do you find somebody that's going to do it. And uh, the division I worked at, we had all of our narcotics guys and our vice unit guys, and there's some gnarly looking dudes that work out there. And usually it would come through an informant there. An informant would come forward and go, Hey, I know this guy. I know this girl who says they're looking to have somebody killed, whether it be another drug dealer, a loved one. And we had a couple, two guys out of my division, not saying their names. They both still work there. And both of these guys did it several times. Really? And, yeah. Uh, several times. It happens more and, times than we would like to believe. Absolutely. And keep some shows about that. Oh, and it's where, crazy. You know, I mean, they, it's like twenty five hundred bucks. You know, it's really? like, oh man. I mean, it's it's not even like, oh, I've got a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it's like, hey, I'll pay you twenty five hundred bucks. I mean, we, you know, we had a, a a famous deal that happened here in Tulsa, and I'm hoping we get Sheriff Vic Rigolato on our show here to talk about this case. Um, it was a, a an oil gas guy, last name was Sweeney, um, that he was dealing with some gas stations in Tulsa that were owned by a couple Middle Eastern guys or a Middle Eastern guy, and, and the guy quit paying his bills. And so the oil gas guy, Sweeney, cut him off. He's like, man, I'm not giving you any more gas, basically, for your store. And so this guy hired a gangster for five grand, who wow. then the gangster found some young guys, I think for like 2000 bucks, <laughs> to walk into this guy's office in broad daylight and shot and killed him. I mean, $2,000. You know, and everybody was convicted. I think there were like four people convicted for this. So that's, that's wow. ridiculous. Yeah. Hey, well, the thing that really got me and how I came across Maria was that I read this great article about some Doral bank murders that involved Santeria. So can you tell us a little bit about what Santeria is and can you speak to the Doral bank murders? Well, Santeria is um, it's a religion of sorts that um, I think uh, originated in, in Cuba or is practiced prim principally in Cuba. I don't know that much about it, but I know that they have, you know, saints um, that they pray to, but there is, um, they, they, there are different levels of hierarchy within Santeria. Uh, and there could be um, people that have had particular training uh, in, in Santeria. Uh, that achieve a high status. Uh, and um, uh, I think that it involves an element of um, praying or doing some rituals to saints to achieve a particular result. Um, I don't want to say witchcraft because I don't know enough about it to say that it's witchcraft, but it's, you know, it's sort of supernatural stuff. It's kind um, of a question. Is it kind of accustomed to, like in New Orleans, we have a lot of voodoo that goes on there. Is it similar in that? Just a little bit different take on I think it? voodoo is more, you know, uh, on the African or Haitian side. Okay. But um, I, I do know that it, it can involve, like, voodoo sacrifice of animals. Uh, but, you know, there may be someone that really knows about Santeria watching and saying, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I really, I'm not an expert in Santeria at all. It's sort you of... Know, 
You, you know, know more than we I do. I say, I'm sure you know more than <laughs> the fact that you say with an accent clearly shows you know more yeah, than we absolutely. do. Absolutely. We and, know about the song Santeria. That was yeah, a pretty oh, good song. Sublime? Yeah, yes. Sublime saying Santeria. Yeah. Okay, so but, um, can you tell but, us about uh, the you know, there was, there, there was an allegation that there were high-level executives at Rural who were performing Santeria rituals at the bank. Um, I know that that's something that's been publicly reported. Has that, uh, has that gone? Have they figured out who actually has committed that murder? Or is that a still an ongoing case? I don't believe so. And I don't know whether there was an active investigation because I'm not with the office anymore. And if I knew, I couldn't say. Gotcha. Uh, but very, very sad that this gentleman uh, was came to Puerto Rico with his family. I think it was like around 2010. Um, and to straighten out a troubled bank. Um, with high hopes that, you know, that he could get it back on its feet and, um, and uncovered apparently, uh, you know, some irregularities at the bank and, and, and there was a hit on him because it was, I believe as my recollection serves me, he was on his way home mm -hmm. and there was a car that uh, he was stalled in traffic and there was a car that stood next to him and, uh, you know, point blank fires, uh, fired at. So very, very sad. And to make it even more dramatic and sadder, it was his wife's birthday the next day. He was having a big party for her and had wow. flown in relatives for the occasion. So very, very sad. But there have been, if you followed, um, you know, crime and crime waves on this island, that is not an unusual uh, way to commit murders. Um, and uh, there was another case uh, that comes to mind uh, where a uh, lieutenant at the federal uh, detention center, a metropolitan detention center, right across from my office in Puerto Rico, uh, was actually, there was a hit put out on him, and that's exactly how he was killed. Uh, there was someone surveilling him when he left the prison that followed him and shot him while he was driving home. Man, it seems like it's pretty easy to hire a hitman in Puerto Rico. Yeah, well, I mean, regrettably, I think, you know, there are many people that would consider that in a certain, you know, segment of society, but, you know, there's so many good and decent people on this island, but it's just overshadowed by the drama of these type of events. Yeah. I've been to San Juan. It's a beautiful island. Super charming. Beautiful. And people uh, here are really very kind, generous people, but, you know, unfortunately there's crime and, you know, that sometimes overshadows the good, although it's a minority of the people. Right, absolutely. But that's what people hear about, you know. I mean, people go down there, they go on vacation. I don't think there's a whole lot of crime that actually happens with uh, the tourist population, is there? No, unless uh, recently there was um, there was some crime with, with tourists that wandered into a, an area they did, should not have wandered uh, in old San Juan. Um, and it's called La Perla, and one of them was murdered. Oh, goodness. Wow. That kind of stuff. But usually you're right. I mean, usually it's, they're well, fine. You just, you need to know where to go and where not to go. And that goes for, you know, gosh, even here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I yeah, mean, anywhere absolutely. it's like, you know, there, there are certain parts of town where certain people shouldn't be. Right. right. Um, and I know, mean, that, tourism that is everywhere. the major industry on this island. So most tourists come here and are safe and enjoy their stay. Um, and it's uneventful. Well, what other cases do, as a prosecutor come to mind that you were like, now this is pretty interesting besides Miss Black Widow and her failing to pay. Dude, if somebody, if I hired somebody to kill somebody and say I was going to give them some money, I would give them the money. You know they're going to kill you if you don't give them the money. I mean, they've proven that, right? But, but most victims don't get that choice. That's true. They never learn of it and, you know, they just, it happens. Well, I don't know if you've been following the news on the island, but there is uh, there is a recent case in which I am not involved, but uh, in which um, I've been interviewed about just as uh, legal commentary that involves a former a boxer by the name of Felix Verdejo. Um, and he is alleged, and I say alleged because that is a case, uh, the trial has not yet occurred. And I'm just commenting on information that is part of the public record. It's already, you know, uh, been it's revealed. It's already out there, yeah. It's out there. Um, and uh, the information comes primarily from a complaint that was filed against a co-dependent. And the complaint, as you know, it's an informal charging mechanism 
uh, to establish probable cause when there hasn't been a grand jury indictment yet. And so because of that, it's accompanied by an affidavit that one of the law enforcement agents involved in the investigation has to attest to before a federal magistrate. And based on that uh, affidavit, the magistrate determines if there's probable cause uh, or not, right? So we get most of the information that's publicly known from that affidavit. And it's really a wild story and a very, very sad story um, because he was involved in an extramarital affair uh, with a very lovely young woman uh, by the name of Keshla, um, who disappeared. Um, and there was there were efforts to locate her and um, her body was found. Uh, it had been dropped over the Teodoro Moscoso Bridge uh, and the um, co-defendant who is apparently complicit, at least from his version in the crime, um, tells a story, a very, very sad, tragic story, where this woman um, found out that she was pregnant from Verdejo, and um, she had actually been getting lab tests the day that she was killed. And the way he tells it, uh, she was summoned by the boxer um, uh, to get into the car where he was driving, right in front of the public housing project where she lived. And uh, she noticed that there was somebody in back and became immediately concerned. And the boxer allegedly said, don't worry, nothing's going to happen to you. But then he punched her in the face. If you can imagine, a professional boxer does that with a high degree of force, uh, knocked her out unconscious. And then they apparently injected her, her with heroin. Mm. Um, and then the, the co-defendant, the one that confessed, claims that he tied her hands and her feet and tied a block around her feet. And then they drove to the Teodoro Moscoso Bridge, which is one of the major bridges here on the island. It's actually the bridge that leads to the airport, the San Juan International Airport. And allegedly in the midst of rush hour traffic at 8.30 in the morning, dumped, they dumped the body over the bridge. At 8.30 uh, in the morning. 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and there, there is some footage that has emerged of the car uh, in the, 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 and around the area of the bridge. And um, the way the co-defendant tells the story, the boxer uh, saw that one of her arms got loose and actually dove in the water. And he claims tied the brick around her neck uh, and then swam to shore. Um, so that is essentially the confession made by the co-defendant uh, that implicates both himself and the boxer, he obviously must be cooperating with the authorities because if not, all of that would be hearsay and not admissible in court unless he took the stand to testify regarding that, right? Um, and very tragic, she was a very, very lovely young woman who was tragically killed uh, and her baby was killed as well. So. Very, very sad story, and, and her family is devastated over that. It's very, yeah, very tragic. I can't even, even if you're not a lovely woman, you shouldn't have that happen to you. That's, Absolutely. That's, that's I, I agree with you. That's, I that's, just say that because she was, but no one deserves to die that way. No, not at all. No that's, one deserves to die at all through foul play like that, well, but now particularly that, in that kind of violent manner. Yeah. I have, I have, and the autopsy revealed, um, and this, again, has been publicly reported, that um, she drowned. There was water in her lungs, so she was alive when she hit the water. Well, they didn't give her enough heroin so she wouldn't stop breathing. I guess it was their intent that she was already dead before they threw her in. Um, yeah. uh, Maria, so, uh, you know, listening to you mention the bridge, gosh, even saying Maria, your own name and everything you say there, obviously you say you've been there a long time, you've got the accent. She's I'm, charming. I'm assuming you are bilingual. Uh, I am. Um, is that just something Spanish you was my first language. Oh, really? Okay. I was just yes. going to ask if that was something you learned through, you know, through prosecuting there in, in Miami and no. down there. And, and my own question here is being a federal prosecutor in Puerto Rico, were the cases done in English? Are they done in Spanish? If you're, if you know, are you able to do both? I'm assuming obviously, cause you're a defense attorney. Now you obviously can help locals being that you are in fact bilingual and cool. know the system quite well. That's a really good question. And actually I get that question a lot. Well, dang, but I everything I was special. in federal court and the official language is English. Okay. Everything is done in English. All the proceedings, uh, the testimony, um, the jurors have to be bilingual, fully bilingual. 
And as you might imagine, um, because a lot of witnesses may be locals that do not speak English, we, we use translators a lot uh, sure. during uh, trials and court proceedings. I actually, speaking of translating, Howard and I have been bouncing some ideas while we were in New York having a few cocktails. But I had a, uh, a, a I was an, I'm, I just retired two months ago. Uh, I was an expert witness here for, for gangs and, you know, uh, violent crime in Tulsa, essentially. But I had a case a few years ago, a gang murder, where the guys were using social media and, you know, posting uh, all in gangster language things, reference people keeping their mouths shut things about the homicide that occurred and it was actually I, I cannot speak any foreign language but I know street language I know uh, you know I don't bonics is the term or whatever gangster language but we would have this um, screen going and the snapchats were up there what this guy was texting just in straight gangster language and so I'd have to read it in gangster language to the jury and then really break it down in simple you know layman's white guy terms i guess you know for everybody to understand so to speak right uh, there is a definite lingo and as you probably know from your law enforcement experience that um in narcotics cases where i um, mean if, if you ever heard anyone um in a narcotics transaction mention oh, yeah. the word cocaine or heroin or whatever they'd know you were a snitch that Absolutely. just never happens yep. and things are always spoken in code and so when those cases go to trial it's not unusual to have a DEA agent testify as an expert with respect to that coded language. Yep. Well, so what do you, how do you say cocaine if you don't say cocaine? There's many different ways. Sometimes they say brides to refer to. Oh, know, that's bricks. like also we we call it you know cocaine here is called soft or it's called ice cream or you know something like that. I mean that's the soft is the big one. You know is kind of what everybody uses right. here. I only speak redneck sarcasm. I know. That's why English. that's why Howard can never buy drugs. He's yeah, do you like, have any of the marijuana <laughs> do you have any of the marijuana for sale? I would ask for ice cream and they give me some coke and I was like, This is not what I want. I want some chocolate syrup on this. this is what I, I wanted want. ice cream for real. So we now that you're actually on the other side, I mean, how's that feel? I mean, are do you just take whatever cases come in the door? Are you pretty picky no. about it? We we don't take every case. Um, but you know, everybody's entitled to a defense. Sure. Uh, and sometimes you can tell a client is problematic and it's going to be difficult to represent that person and have a, a you know, meaningful, um, relationship with that person, uh, in the context of the case. And just sometimes, you know, you get that sense, uh, that it's not a good marriage. Uh, but, um, that primarily happens with, uh, civil cases, um, you know, criminal cases, we try to help everybody that we can. And um, sometimes helping them means, um, you know, uh, negotiating a good plea. Uh, the government has a strong case, and particularly with uh, minimum mandatory sentences that are so high in narcotics cases, right? Anything, you know, over five keys is 10-year minimum mandatory, right? Um, and uh, sometimes if the case is vulnerable, uh, if the case has a legal defense, you can file, you know, case dispositive motions like a motion to suppress, a motion to dismiss. Uh, they're a little up, up uh, they're a little uphill, but we have prevailed on a few, and and the government has had to dismiss the case. So, are are, um, are, are you only doing uh, defense work in federal court, or are you doing it there at the? I guess, our office Puerto does Rican defense state work. Level, or country level. Our, our office does defense work in, in uh, Puerto Rico, although I only practice in federal court in Puerto Rico. However, in Florida, uh, I do uh, handle, and our office handles both federal and state okay. uh, cases. Just trying and to find out. criminal you know, and civil as well. If Howard ever gets himself in trouble down there, I just want to see where you could help him out at. You, well, you've got my number, done. Howard. <laughs> yeah, Puerto Rico is beautiful. I want to go back, man. Let's go. Very nice. We could go down Please there. Please give me a give me a call when you're here. Absolutely, uh, for sure. We'll go. You got to show us some. How do you say Bacardi? You say Bacardi. 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 Oh, we butchered that. <laughs> See, we're speaking redneck. Well, we really appreciate you being on today. It's been a it's been a pleasure. It's it's nice to see the perspective of somebody who actually has has to take the law and then put it into play and then actually put somebody in jail over it no it's uh gosh i mean through my years you know i was a cop almost 25 years and there were plenty of prosecutors that i have done cases with throughout you you know through through the years 
And then they went into private practice and were defense attorneys. And uh, it, I don't want to say it makes it, quote, unquote, enjoyable in court. Um, you know, I never took anything personal from defense attorneys. I understand the process and, and why we have what it is. When they make things personal and come after you as a, quote, unquote, dirty cop, as opposed to going after just procedures, then obviously things do yeah, get yeah. personal. But when you've had former prosecutors that you've done cases with, they're just in there doing their job for us on the law enforcement side. They're on the stand. You don't take it personal. Um, you know, you kind of, uh, gosh, I'll tell you, there's even guys that are defense attorneys I've had drinks with, you know, once Absolutely. a case has been wrapped up and something like that. It's just part of the job. Hey, we're having drinks. Everybody has this. a job to do, but Absolutely. I will say this. One of the things that I have learned being a defense attorney the last seven years is that it's important uh, to have a strong defense as well to keep a check and balance on the government. Oh. Um, I think that 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 is very important, you know, constitutional rights and civil liberties. Well, are and, important. absolutely. Maria, we, we've only got a minute or two here and I know you don't know my story, but I actually just recently put out a book called Breaking Blue, The Real Stories of Cops Falsely Accused. I was uh, identified as an unindicted co-conspirator by the federal government back in 2010. Wow. And so, you know, from whence I speak. Uh, One thousand percent. And, you know, I, I interviewed other cops across the country about different things that happened to them, not necessarily with the federal government, state government, social media accusa accusations and things like that. So I do know firsthand exactly what you're talking about. Uh, we do have to have, you know, that prosecution side and uh, and a sound defense as well. Hey, I Absolutely. have I have one question before you leave and we never got to it. And I should have circled back when we were talking about it. Um, the uh, Black Widow lady. How much time yeah. did she get? Life. Yeah. Nice. Do you guys have the death penalty there? Well, uh, I mean, well, I guess in, federal. Not yeah. in Puerto not Rico. A, it's unconstitutional yeah. in Puerto Rico, but yeah. we do have it still on the books, although Biden expressed disfavor for it. It right. is still right. technically a law. So on the federal side, yes, it, we've never had a, a death penalty verdict in Puerto Rico, but it is uh, permissible under the law. Where's she serving her time? Do you know? I don't know. I can find out for you and text it to you, but I don't know. Off has, has she gotten pregnant? In it's custody? in the state. Hopefully, hopefully not. In, uh, hopefully not. Rico. Yeah, hopefully not Spain. She might come out with more kids. <laughs> no, no, definitely not Spain. <laughs> Send her to South Puerto Dakota. Rico. Yeah, there that, you go. That would be a change. But it's hey. been great to be with you guys. I have a lot of other war stories, so whenever you want to chat again, just let me know. Oh, Absolutely. we'd love to have you back, Maria. You're fantastic. Thank you, and you're very charming, and you look like I said, you look like you're 35. So, oh maybe. God. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. Thank you so much. Yeah, Have a wonderful time. afternoon and uh, God bless. Thank God you, bless too. you too, man. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.